The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. During the 140 broadcasts of the Cavalcade of America, we've received many letters asking why, in our stories of pioneers, we have not dramatized the life of Eleuther Irene Dupont de Nemours, the pioneer who 136 years ago founded the company which bears his name. So this evening, as the final broadcast in this series, we will present his colorful and dramatic story at the request of many of our listeners. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra will play I See Your Face Before Me from Arthur Schwartz's musical comedy, Between the Devil. <laughs> Cavalcade moves forward. It is the 7th of September, 1784, 
at a quiet country place in the Namur district of France, about 60 miles from Paris. In a high ceiling chamber, aglow with candlelight, sits the Sieur Dupont, Inspector General of Commerce in the cabinet of His Majesty Louis XVI of France. Towards his richly carven high-backed chair walk his two sons, Victor and Irene. My father, I bring my brother Irene to receive from your hand the first investiture of knighthood. Place him before me. Advance, my brother, that you may receive our father's blessing and the right to bear arms as an esquire. Irene, my son, you are 14. Yes, my father. Three years ago, you saw me gird your brother Victor's sword. By birth, you have an equal right with his. You must understand, as I have told you often, that no privilege exists that is not inseparably bound to a duty. This privilege involves a special obligation to devote yourself the service of mankind. Come, kneel. Yes, my father. Now, repeat after me, my son. I, Eleuther Irene Dupont, I, Eleuther Irene Dupont, promise to God, my master, promise to God, my master, to mankind, my brothers, to mankind, my brothers, to follow the code of honor. During the following years after his investiture as an esquire, young Eluter Irene Dupont in his father's apartment in Paris, used to listen to long discussions on the problems of the day by men whose destiny became interwoven into the pattern of his later life, among them being Thomas Jefferson, young American statesman, the Marquis de Lafayette, brilliant young soldier and courtier, the suave, cautious Talleyrand, Dr. James Hutton, the English philosopher, Benjamin Franklin, and finally, the great French scientist and chemist, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier who was to influence Irene's life more than any other person. After one of these evenings, Sir Dupont's guests are departing. I trust you will honor us soon again, gentlemen. Thank you, Monsieur Dupont. Thank you. Dr. Franklin was in fine fettle tonight, was he not, Monsieur Dupont? Indeed, yes, Monsieur Jefferson. He is our political barometer. I am deeply interested in this new world of yours over the sea. You have weathered your storm. I fear ours is just gathering. If they will but listen to reasonable minds like yours, Sieur Dupont. Well, good night, monsieur. Good night, my friend. Good night, monsieur Lavoisier. Bonsoir, monsieur. Good night, Irene. Good night, Mr. Jefferson. Must you go to, monsieur Lavoisier? I have promised Irene that I would first look at his little windowsill garden. It has thrived marvelously, monsieur, since you gave me the saltpeter to mix with the soil. You have done well, Irene. You understand, of course, that it is the mysterious element in the saltpeter nitrogen that makes the plants thrive. It was like a miracle to watch the flowers grow. I wish that I might study chemistry. And why not? Chemists are greatly needed, and one must have an actual yearning toward it, as you have a vast incentive for research and experiment. He's not been the same since you took him to visit the government plant at Esson. He has talked of nothing else since. Mm, did he show you the paper he wrote on how saltpeter is mixed with charcoal and sulfur to make gunpowder? No, I have not seen it. Bring it to me, my son. Why, I, I gave it to Monsieur Levasseur. I will bring it back to show you. I was amazed at its accuracy and discernment. I need to train a successor, someone who can carry on my work. Who knows, Monsieur Dupont? I may find him in your son.
At 16, Irene was taken into the great powder plant at Esson to study and work under the great chemist Lavoisier. At 20, he was Lavoisier's assistant and had married the lovely Sophie Madeleine Dalma. The two planned a peaceful life together at the DuPont country home, Bois de Foss, when suddenly the French Revolution sent Lavoisier to the guillotine and Irene's own father to prison. Young DuPont was obliged to give up his chemical studies and join the National Guard. To support his family, he managed a printing shop that his father had started in the old Capuchin Monastery in Paris. One night as he is working in the shop, he hears a stealthy knock at the door. Who's there? Open quickly. It is I, Sophie. Sophie, precious one. What are you doing in Paris? And in disguise? Wait, I'll bar the door. Hold me fast in your arms, Irene. This is the only way I could get into the prison as a peasant girl. I took food to your father. You saw my father? Yes. Oh, Irene, he's wonderful. I found him there, in that dark, loathsome place. I found him cheerful and charming, teaching a class he has formed to the other prisoners in political economy and philosophy. I brought him some eggs and bread, and he shared it with them. I brought you some, too. Oh, it was brave of you to do this. I've not eaten for days, it seems... The guard has called out constantly now, night and day. It's terrible. Oh, my dear. I cannot bear to see you so miserable. Well, tell me more of my father. Did he give you any message for me? He said not to give way to despair. That we must all be united to comfort and help each other. Oh, Irene. I wish you could see him. Oh, Sophie. Has, has his number been called? Tomorrow. Is there no hope for him? Was there hope for a man like Lavoisier? They're mowing down our finest, Sophie. Robespierre, the butcher, has proclaimed France has no need of scientists. But I shall print their works to live after them. You must be cautious, Irene. Think what would happen if they took you. Oh, we must be prepared for anything now. Tomorrow, who knows, I may stand with the guard and listen to those drums beating the death march of my father. I heard rumors in the streets that they're turning against Robespierre. Idle talk. Bloodshed is all they think of. Bloodshed. I'll hate it all my life. I shall never forget the horror of what I've seen. Rest a few minutes, darling. And then, then I must go. Will we ever be together again in our own home, do you think? Oh, who can say? Oh, it's not safe for you to be with me here now. You must go at once, Sophie. But I... And listen to them. They're like wolves. Kiss me goodbye. Sophia, I can't let you go. Oh. Oh, Irene, they've come for you. Quiet. Hide behind those curtains. Citizen of Earth! Who calls? To the guard, citizen. Robespierre's arrested. Robespierre arrested? I can't believe it. Come in, citizen. They have turned against Robespierre? It's true, citizen. I myself saw him taken. Sophie, my darling, we're safe. Robespierre has fallen. The reign of terror is over. My father will live. Irene's father was saved from the guillotine, but he soon realized that political discord would make life in France unbearable. The new republic of the United States offered freedom. So the elder DuPont started a plan of colonization for French refugees in the new world. With his second wife, his two sons, Victor and Irane, their wives, Josephine and Sophie, and their children, he sailed for America, arriving on New Year's Day, 1800. At their new home, Good Stay, at Bergen Point, New Jersey, the DuPonts faced the future confident that ability plus willingness to work would solve the problems facing them. One day, young Irene is out hunting with Colonel Louis de Toussaint, a French-born artillery officer who had come to America with the Marquis de Lafayette and had remained to make his home in this country. Ah, I have missed again, Colonel de Toussaint. Yes. Three times now this American powder has failed. Is there no place where we can purchase better? No, Irene, that little country store where we replenished our powder horns this noon is the only place nearby. 
You mean that this worthless stuff is the best we can secure? Yes. But we paid such a high price for it. No, it is the regular price, but uh, American-made powder is not up to foreign standards. This country depends on Europe for all its needs. It's amazing. So many Americans make hunting their source of living. Everywhere I see the need for powder. For food, furs, clearing of land, defense against the Indians. Yes. Why, in this country, I should think that gunpowder was almost as important as bread. Is, that is true. Since I first served with the Marquis de Lafayette, it has always been the same. The need for a good powder mill in this country seems to be vital. That gives me an idea, Colonel de Toussaint. Yes? I was taught by a great master. Perhaps there is a way that I can put my knowledge to work. After visiting several of the American powder mills and estimating the necessary costs of building, Irene consulted his father, who wrote to his friend Thomas Jefferson, then vice president of the United States. Soon after this, Irene calls on Mr. Jefferson at the Capitol in Philadelphia. I did not know if you would remember me, Mr. Jefferson. Very well, indeed. You are the young lad who always sat in the corner listening to our discussions at your father's in Paris. Yes, monsieur. Ah, that was fascinating company. Dr. Franklin, Mirabeau, Lafayette, Lavoisier. Monsieur Lavoisier was my teacher and good friend, monsieur. A great scientist. He was a victim of the terror, was he not? Yes, monsieur. I saw him die. But I determined that his works should live. I printed his books. They are the best works on chemistry in existence today. Your father writes me that you had practical experience with Lavoisier at his son. Yes, monsieur. And he suggests that you would like to start a powder mill here in America. Yes, monsieur. I feel it would be advantageous if America were independent of Europe in the manufacture of quality powder. If you approve my plan, it will encourage my father to include powder making in his projects. So far, he is... Not overly impressed, I'm afraid. I think it's an excellent plan. From our earliest colonial days, there's been nothing so much needed as a dependable supply of good powder. And it will also be the means of keeping you in this country. We need citizens like you. Monsieur. I trust you will build your mill near the new federal city. Uh, with your permission, monsieur, I have picked out a site on the Brandywine River. There is a colony of French at Wilmington. I will get along better there. Wherever you locate... Be assured we shall welcome you in your work here. The quality of the powder from Irene's mill was at once recognized. But it was sold, as was customary, on long-term credit. And Irene constantly had to borrow from banks to finance his operations. Thus, debts and insufficient capital faced him always. And his dark hair grayed, and his tall, slender figure became stooped with care. But wagon trains moved through the virgin wilderness of new territories, bearing the precious kegs of powder, which meant so much to the settlers and frontiersmen. In May 1815... Sieur Dupont returned from a visit to France and rejoined his family on the Brandywine. Though 77 years old and suffering from illness, his optimism and cheer meant much to Irene in his struggles. Two years later, late one evening, we find the father and son in the home on the Brandywine. I am truly proud of you, Irene. You have made your Elitarian mills a credit to our family. And your adopted country. We still have far to go, Father. Our creditors are still making demands. Do you realize that you are a year older than I was when I invested you with your sword? And though you are the youngest, you are in fact the head of the family? Material success is not to be compared with the opportunity to serve, Irene. The fact that you have never swerved from your duty is the reason I am proud. Well, my son, 
It's late. I will bid you good night. Good night, Father. But, no, what may that fire. be? Fire, Monsieur Dufault! The mill is on fire! What's that? The mill is on fire? Uh, call all the men. A uh, former bucket brigade at once. We will join you. The men are rushing away with their families. They're terrified. Well, they must stand and fight the fire. Here in here, bring axes. The men, return to your post, Father, I beg of you. You're ill. You mustn't go yourself. Everyone is needed. Come, follow me. We mustn't let the fire reach the powder storehouse, or we'll all be blown to kingdom come. Hurry, men! Get water from the river! Father! Stay out of the fire! Someone stop him! He's going in! Father! Exhausted by his work in stemming the fire, Pierre Samuel Dupont de Namur died on August 7th, 1870. Without his father's aid and guidance, Irene faced many more struggles and hardships, and his courage never faltered. But he was no longer the homesick French lad, but an American, proud of his citizenship and heartily interested in the land of his adoption. In 1824, the Marquis de Lafayette made a triumphal tour of the United States, and one of the first homes he chose to visit was that of Irene and Sophie Dupont. After dinner, the three are in Irene's little office. My father would have rejoiced over the way you've been received in this country, General Lafayette. Your father was a remarkable man, Irene. Many times Mr. Jefferson spoke of his happiness in having Monsieur Dupont settled here. Irene's father loved America. He had faith in it. He was right. Never has any country gone so far in such a short time. You have had your part in it, Irene. I like to feel that I have. You are no longer homesick for France? No. This is home to me now, with my children growing up around me, like the trees I've planted. I was pleased to hear that President Monroe had appointed you a director in the Bank of America and that your opinion is being sought on new legislation to help manufacturing and farming. I have always felt that there should be a close alliance between the two. We consume each other's products and depend upon each other in so many ways. I was very much interested in what your son Alfred said at dinner. You're finding many new uses for products produced in your manufacturing process. Yes. It's a most interesting feature of our chemical works. To find a use for what once was waste. I believe it's the first time it's been successfully attempted in America, and I regard it as our most important step for the future. You're very fortunate, Irene. Very fortunate in having a son to carry on your business. Yes. Alfred likes to study chemistry, and he'll be my assistant here, as I was to Lavoisier when I was the lad's age. I regret, but I must say good night to you both. You know, General Lafayette... Since my accident, I retired very early. Oh, I'm so sorry. I hadn't heard of it. At the time of the fire, my wife was injured. Oh, I'm, I'm very much better now. I only need rest. Good night, General Lafayette. We're so happy and proud to have you with us. It's one of the great privileges of my trip, madame. Don't forget, Irene. You must make an early start in the morning. Uh, could I ever forget? Oh, it is a shame, monsieur, that he must leave at this time. You see, after the accident, we had nothing left. And the banks would lend money for the rebuilding, only on Irene's personal notes. He has to ride back and forth to Philadelphia every five or six days. Thirty miles each way to renew them. Yes, I must show myself to the bankers each week so they may be sure I'm still alive. You see, monsieur, it was not only the money for the mills, but he has taken care of all the families of his workmen. He has built them new homes and pensioned them. That was but just. You've taken heavy burdens on your shoulders, Irene. I understand that you have satisfied all your father's and brother's creditors also. Why not? They would have done the same for me. Was it necessary, the pensions, the rebuilding of homes? My father would have wished it so. I am only living up to my pledge to him as a boy when he gave me my sword. That one you see on the wall above my desk. 
he pledged us always to be firmly united, to comfort each other in every sorrow, to stand by each other in every danger. Yes, and he himself lived up to that pledge, even in his friendships. That and his code. No privilege exists that is not inseparably bound to a duty. After year, Irene saw his debts grow less and his business increase. He died on October 31st, 1834, beloved and respected by all who knew him. The editor of the Delaware State Journal summed up his life when he wrote, We have lost a friend whom we loved and venerated. This community, a benefactor. Our state, its most useful and valuable citizen. We salute the spirit of freedom and opportunity had made it possible for pioneers such as Eleuther Irene Dupont to find their place in the cavalcade of America. When young E.I. Dupont set up his factory on the banks of Brandywine Creek, he was satisfying a basic need, for powder was essential to the pioneers of westward-pushing America. About 1890, the DuPont Company began manufacture of a new explosive, dynamite, a much more efficient blasting agent than old-fashioned black powder. Of all the chemical products that have come from the research laboratory, none has contributed more to the building of America than dynamite, which helps mine our coal and metals, build our highways, dams, and tunnels, and clear forests and fields for agriculture. At the turn of the present century, America entered an amazing period of growth, emerging in recent times as the greatest industrial nation on earth. As America went forward, so did DuPont, for the company continued through chemistry to serve basic human needs. An early milestone was DuPont's pioneer work in helping to establish a dyestuffs industry in this country. This not only freed our color-using industries from foreign domination, but led to the development of many allied products, such as chemicals for improving rubber and gasoline, ingredients for medicines, perfume bases, neoprene, man-made rubber, and many others. In the last two decades, DuPont also has contributed a number of products based on cellulose, among them duco lacquer, pyrolin and other plastics, coated fabrics such as fabricoid and tontine, motion picture and x-ray film, rayon yarn, and cellophane transparent wrapping material. During the 136 years of the DuPont Company's history, chemistry has created these things and many more, has made jobs for countless workers, has opened new markets for products of farm, forest, and mine. The sum total of it all finds apt expression in the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> This program concludes the current series of the Cavalcade of America. The authors, actors, musicians, and the sponsor have all had fun as well as hours of work in presenting this program each week for your entertainment and, we hope at times, your inspiration. We thank the many who have taken the trouble to express their interest. Those of you who write requesting it will be advised by special letter of any future plans. In the meantime, thank you and good luck. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.